1, we established that the Christian faith was not built on blind faith. Now, <clears throat> what difference does it make? What difference does this make to me? Well, for a start, it means that I no longer have to rely on my own concepts of who God is or make up from my own imagination or guessing. I've got a source from outside of myself. To answer the question of what difference does it make anyway, I want to begin by looking at a doctrine that is Jesus' definition of right and wrong. Now, a lot of people got their own definition of what a good person is. This is Jesus' definition of right and wrong. Interestingly enough, this, this uh, doctrine, three out of the five major world religions believe to be the Word of God. The Jews certainly believe that this is the Word of God. Uh, they call it the law and commandments. They used to carry it uh, around in an ark. They, they kept it in their temple. Eventually it was lost. I think Harrison Ford's still out there looking for it. The ark. <laughs> right? Christians certainly believe in this doctrine as the word of God because I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. Jesus referred to them often and commented on them. Even, just as a matter of interest, even Muslims at least pay lip service to believing the Ten Commandments are the Word of God because the Ten Commandments are contained in the first five books of the Bible and Muslims believe that the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, are the Word of God. I can prove that to you if you'll open your Qurans. It's Surah number 29, verse 46. Uh, come to a religious discussion and you don't bring your Qurans with you? What's going on here? Okay. <laughs> Wrong audience. Okay. Even atheists sometimes pay lip service to the Ten Commandments. You know, I don't believe in God, but I go along with the Ten Commandments. I never killed anybody, right? Well, we're going to look at the other nine commandments. Uh, anybody here ever seen uh, the Charlton Hester movie, The Ten Commandments? Put up your hand if you've ever seen that movie. Yeah? Okay. You've seen the movie. Now we're going to read the book, okay? <laughs> it's much shorter. Hollywood chucks in a lot of extra stuff. This is Jesus' definition of right and wrong. You know, everybody says uh, they got their own definition of what a good bloke is, right? I'm a good bloke, and you know, I never killed anybody. And what a good bloke you must be, by the way, if you never killed anybody, you know, that's a great, you're a great guy. Um, we all got our own definition of what a good person is. This is Jesus' definition. His definition is keeping, always keeping these commandments. Now, <clears throat> one small caution as we look at this law or commandments. Jesus told a, uh, a parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector. He, he told a parable about a good man and, and, and a bad guy, right? But Jesus actually condemned this good man, the Pharisee, not because of the good things he'd done. He condemned him because... He thought that the times he had broken the commandments should be overlooked just because there was some guy next to him, somebody else who'd broken them a lot worse than he had. And it's kind of, and Jesus actually condemned this kind of thinking. And it's, it's kind of human nature, isn't it? You know, like you, um, you know, you get pulled over, right? You pull over speeding, right? Well, you wouldn't get pulled over, you, you get pulled over speeding, right? No, I'm only kidding. Right, you get pulled over. Now, what's the first thing you say? Uh, officer, really, normally I'm a good driver, you know, and, and, and really, you know, you should, be, you should be out looking for the real criminals, the bank robbers and the murderers. Well, that always, you know, impresses the law enforcer, of course, because immediately when you say that to the policeman, you know, you should be out looking for the real criminals, the bank robbers and the murderers, immediately, what does the policeman do? He goes, of course. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I'm going off to get me some bank robbers and some murderers. I don't know what came over me disturbing a good citizen like you. <laughs> no, that's not how it goes. In actual fact, the policeman is particularly insulted because you're actually asking him to be corrupt. That is, overlook your law breaking just because there's other people who have broken the law worse than you have. Hey, they're all spitting out there. Yeah, you're right, but I've caught you. Right? Now, all I'm asking is that 
This is Jesus' uh, warning about approaching the commandments, that we don't take that attitude. That's the Pharisee attitude. In other words, Jesus' attitude about the commandments, I, I refer to um, a scripture that says, God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, not just the things that are not as bad as someone else. Okay? In other words, if you do the crime, you do the time. Here's the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm going to read each commandment, and underneath, I'm going to, to read a comment, commentary from Jesus or other New Testament writers, okay? So, first of all, commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. And Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Now, can I have a show of hands for anyone who thinks they've kept this commandment all of the time? Just before you do, I've got to warn you, there's another one a little later on about lying. I wouldn't want you to break two at once here. (laughs) (laughs) Commandment number two. Do not make for yourselves images or idols of anything in heaven or on earth. Now, an image or an idol, uh, an idol can be anything that puts God in a second place because, you know, we can idolise your car or your house or, or the footy or, or whatever. You know, you can idolise lots of things. So an idol can also be, though, something that, you know, you, obviously you carve out a statue and you worship that statue or you, you can't, uh, or you serve that statue. Uh, the Bible, Isaiah the prophet, actually makes light of the idea that anyone would actually carve out a statue out of wood and worship it. It says, you know, you, you carve out your statue out of wood and the, the wood that's left over, you know, you, you start a fire and you start cooking your dinner, you know, and you, you're warming your hands over there and you start worshipping this God here and you're warming your hands over here and you're worshipping him. <laughs> it's the same piece of wood, you know? <laughs> Obviously, Isaiah the prophet and I are only ones with the same sense of humour there, don't no? Sorry, no. <laughs> But an image can also be something that's in your head. You see, an image is something, uh, for instance, you ever heard anyone say, well, I think God is love and I think God is this. I think whatever you think, you're imagining it. It's an image, isn't it? You're, You're making an image of God. You're making up who you think God is. Commandment number three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Oh, my God. When was the last time you said that and weren't referring in reverence to God? Jesus says, I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. It's almost like saying this is, you know, this is the easiest one to keep here. All you've got to just use any words, but just don't use the name of God or Jesus as a swear word, what are the only two religious names in our society we use, you know, as a, as a swear word or misusing? Uh, you know, just once it's like to see someone just walking along the street, you know, and stub their toe and go, Oh, Buddha! <laughs> <laughs> For Muhammad's sake, will you stop that, you know? <laughs> It doesn't happen. In fact, you know, I always like to talk to people from other cultures, countries, religions, and, you know, I've asked them, you know, does anybody ever take the name of Buddha or Muhammad, you know, in that kind of way, you know? And they always laugh at me, like, you must be silly, don't you? Of course not. But the Muslims always have a more nervous laughter about, you know, sort of like, you know, take the name of Allah or Muhammad in vain. I'd rather be riding shotgun for Selman Rusty, thanks very much, you know? <laughs> Doesn't happen doesn't happen. Commandment number four, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labour, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. New Testament says you should not stay away from the church meetings as some are doing. By the way, people who say, you know, I I go along with the Ten Commandments, I never killed anybody. We're up to four so far. Uh, How you going? (laughs) Don't answer yet. Um, (coughs) Commandment number five, honour your father and your mother. 
here, right. <laughs> Commandment number six, you shall not murder. Hey, I, didn't, I never killed anybody, right? <laughs> Got to be right this time. Jesus says, you've heard it said anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. So he's just concerned not only about the outward action, but what goes on in the heart. Now, obviously, anger and murder are not the same kind of uh, degree of crime. In the same way that, you know, well, I steal a million dollars or a dollar, I'm still a thief, but they're entirely different degrees. But nevertheless, he's saying it's the same kind of crime. Different degrees, but same sort of crime. And it starts in the heart. Commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, what's going on in the heart is just as important to Jesus. Number eight, you shall not steal unless it's from the taxation department and you can get away with it. <laughs> Hang on. No, it doesn't say that. Um, <coughs> Thieves will not inherit the kingdom of God, and that includes your tax or the pens from work or whatever. <laughs> Number nine, you shall not give false testimony, that is, lie, including white lies, you know, uh, if there's such a thing. Number ten, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbour. Coveting, that means improperly desiring things that are not yours, uh, Greed uh, it comes under the coveting. All forms of gambling come under this commandment, coveting. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing. One of the things that uh, people always ask me, because they know I've done quite a study of the different religions of the world, and they always say, well, look, they're all the same, aren't they? You know, basically they teach the same things, you know, and I always have to truthfully tell them, well, no, they're basically the opposite on most things, but there is one doctrine that they all agree, they all have in some shape or form, they've all got a hell. Nobody seems too excited about that, I don't know why, but... but they all have the doctrine, cause and effect, that you do something wrong, you've got to pay the price somewhere. It's almost like it's a universal thing. Even people who are not religious seem to have that concept. You do something wrong, you should pay. Well, it's in uh, the Bible's no exception. Even the religions that have uh, reincarnation have hell as well as reincarnation. The Bible's uh, understanding of hell is judgment according to the things you've done. In other words, depending on which commandments you've broken, how many times have you broken them, that's, you know, you say, I never killed anybody. Well, don't worry. You won't be punished for killing anybody, just the commandments you have broken. Uh, so there are degrees in hell. Now, I don't know whether you measure those degrees with Fahrenheit or Celsius, but it's, uh, that's another story. But... <laughs> One of the things that... Uh, Society seems to have full agreement with the Bible and this concept is that good deeds cannot outweigh bad deeds. We seem to have no problem at all agreeing with the Bible on this in, in principle. You know, say a bank robber is caught robbing a bank. He comes before a judge, confesses and says, Your Honour, I admit that I robbed the bank. But I've been in lots of banks I haven't robbed. <laughs> And I've even put some money into a few of them, you know? <laughs> and I've done a lot of good community works. You know, I've done a lot of good things. You know, I, I, um, I, I sponsor a World Vision child and I, I help little old ladies across the street, you know, <laughs> whether they want to go or not, you know? <laughs> he still goes to jail. And he goes to jail because, we, we, in fact, don't we outrage when, the, when someone actually gets a lighter sentence or gets off? We think it's injustice just because they're high profile or they've done a lot of good things. You know, we are outraged. It's injustice. So the, the Bible uh, agrees with us fully on this subject. Uh, or we agree with the Bible, whichever way you want to put it. 
The amazing thing is that somehow people think it's different in the Bible. And it's not. It's not. I, uh, I remember putting this to the test years ago. I, I, um, <clears throat> I confess I've since changed my driving habits, but I, I received, you know, those red light camera intersections, you know. I, I uh, got the fine in the mail. Received the photo of me in the mail, of me driving through a red light. Now, it was not a good shot. I was not smiling at the time. Every time now, you know, I go through one of those intersections, I always make sure I get a decent shot now as, you know, wind the window down and go there. <laughs> just, just to make sure they get a decent photo, you know. <clears throat> I contemplated, can good deeds outweigh bad deeds? So what it did was, I didn't send back the fine and the check to pay for the fine. What I did was, I sent them back another photo of me driving through a green light. <laughs> In fact, I sent him back several photos of me driving through lots of green lights, different expressions on my face. <laughs> to show them that I do lots of good driving. I still got the fine. The reason I still got the fine is because good deeds can never outweigh bad deeds because good deeds are the very least we should do. See, good deeds... You know, you say, oh, I try to be nice to people. Well, shouldn't you always? You know, oh, yeah, you sponsor a World Vision child, you know, or big deal, you know, if you, if you can afford it. Shouldn't we all remember the poor? You know, oh, I try to be good. Oh, I'm, yeah, right. Well, see, good deeds are not better than what's right. They're only what's right. In fact, not doing what's right is wrong. Good deeds can't outweigh bad deeds. So if we've ever broken the law... The problem we have with the God of the Bible is twofold. God is eternal and God is just. I'm reading to you from the Old Testament. The prophet Nehemiah says, The Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. The prophet Isaiah, God says, I am the first and the last. Apart from me there is no God. He says, I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And this is the same quote that Jesus said of himself in the New Testament, again claiming to be God, he says, I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. So God is eternal. Second thing is God is just. The wages of sin is death. That is, the price to be paid for breaking the commandments is death. The man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. And the dead are judged according to the things they have done. So God is eternal. And God is just. He deals with law-breaking. And that's the twofold problem we have if we've ever broken the law. Let me draw you a line. I draw a line along there. Now that line represents your life or my life. Now along that line, I'm going to draw some dots, right? Some dots here, 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 here. Now, those dots represent any of the times in your life where you might have broken the Ten Commandments, any of the Ten Commandments. If it was my lifeline, it would just be one black dot line there. That's another story. But <laughs> the point is, you see, I'm inside time. To me, I'm, I'm up here in my life, right? This line stretches back into my life. It's in the past. Forgive and forget, buddy. You know, I don't see it, right? But to a God who's eternal, he's got your perspective, you see, they exist there, these dots, and he sees them eternally. And as an eternally just God, he's got to deal with them eternally. You know, he can't just uh, go, OK, I'll take this line out of uh, justice, out of judgment, out of hell, and put in heaven there. Because the dots are still there. He still sees the dots, and he sees them eternally. If he puts them into heaven, then heaven becomes imperfect and not heaven anymore. He's overlooking. He can't overlook it. And the problem is that if we have ever broken the law at any point in eternity, God sees it forever. And as an eternally just God, he's got to deal with it forever. And that's why hell is eternal in the Bible. Because he's eternal and just. Not just eternal and just for a while, but eternally just. 
Now, he might delay the justice uh, while it's inside, an eternal God can delay the justice while it's inside time. He has the prerogative to do that. You know, just like the, the policeman who's, who's uh, sitting behind you on the freeway. You're going 10 kilometres over the speed limit, you know. I'm making pretty good time here. You don't see the unmarked police car sitting right behind you, right? And you're trundling along there. Now, that policeman behind you, he, he might not uh, pull you over straight away. He might sit behind you for two or three kilometres, you know, allowing you to soak in the full measure of your choice to break the law. But he's not going to just let you keep on going for 100 k's and then pull off somewhere. He appoints a time where he says, enough is enough, pull over driver, and you cop the fine. And that's, that's like us in time, isn't it? I'm trundling along here, it can't be that bad. There's plenty of other people breaking the law worse than me. Look at all these cars going faster. You know, and where is this justice anyway, right? But once we're outside of time, an eternal God deals with this eternally. So the problem we've got is these dots here, because they exist eternally, right? So if we've broken the law against an eternally just God, then we must pay death, judgment, according to things we've done, Death, judgment, according to things we've done eternally. Or we need a substitute. But hey, a substitute would have to be someone who, they'd have to be a fellow human being, it wouldn't be a true substitute. It'd have to be someone who's never broken the law. I mean, you know, I can't uh, be a substitute and do the time for someone in jail if I'm already in jail myself for my own law breaking. But a substitute would also have to be someone who would pay death, judgment, according to things I've done, eternally. They'd have to go to hell eternally. Otherwise, it would, and mathematics wouldn't add up, right? Or a substitute would have to be someone who was already eternal. An eternal one would have to die. Death! But how can someone who's eternal die? And who's eternal except God? And how is God a man? And, and who except God has never broken the law? This is the very concept of the eternal Son of God, sinless Son of God. Coming to earth, being born as a man, living without ever breaking the law and taking an eternity worth of hell, that is dying, an eternal one dying on the cross for all those who will believe. So that the justice, eternal justice, see as an eternal one, he swallows up those dots from in the past and in the future, all at one point in eternity, as an eternal one dying. So that forgiveness is secured without overlooking any justice. For all those who will believe, what does it mean to believe? Well, it means to believe in Jesus as Lord and Saviour. It means to believe in what he said. He said, why would you call me Lord and not do what I say? To believe in what he said. Well, you know, the first words that Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry, in fact, the very first word, was repent. Now, that's not, not just an, a religious term. It's used still in our court systems in some cases. Repent. It comes from the Greek word metanoia. It means to turn or to change. So in this case, it means to turn, change from deliberately breaking the commandments and turning to the one who will pay the price on that cross. To turn or to change. But you know, there's something far more personal about this repentance because, uh, you know, the Ten Commandments are not just some cosmic right and wrong. They might be all of that, but they're much more than that because the very... Any of you who are uh, familiar with the Old Testament would know that the very personal character of God is tied up with those Ten Commandments. So that in breaking any of them, it's not just a right and wrong, you're actually personally offending God. So there's a broken relationship. This is the heart part of repentance, that there's a broken relationship. And here's where the other part of the, the part to do with the heart in repentance, because the cost of repairing that broken relationship 
That is the justice is paid by God through Jesus dying on that cross. And if you really believe that, this comes back to the belief. See, if you really believe that, you can't deliberately go on breaking any of the commandments because you believe that all law breaking is paid for on that cross. He took our sins in his body. And all the law breaking that I've done, past, present and future, all comes back to that one point in eternity when an eternal one died on that cross. Well, repentance has something to do with the heart. Actually, I'll give you an example. You know, there's a, there's a lady, a uh, relative on my wife's side of the family. Her name is Pauline. At least I thought her name was Pauline. It turns out her name is Kirsten. Um, <laughs> well, she stood up in front of the family one day and said, you know, that's it. I've had it with you people. You know, I'm highly offended. You've been calling me by the wrong name all these years. My name is Kirsten. If you don't stop it, I'm never going to speak to you again. Whoa. <laughs> well, oh, you, you could have knocked me over the feather. I didn't understand or realise all this. Of course, you know, you can understand the family's confusion because, of course, Pauline sounds so much like Kirsten, doesn't it? <laughs> the point is, the point is, oh, I don't know about that one, but anyway, the point is we were repentant. That is we realised we'd been offending some more than others who didn't even understand or realise before. But we no longer wanted to offend. You see, it's not so much that uh, I think the most important thing from Kirsten's point of view was not so much that we became perfect overnight because I can tell you old habits die hard and many a time the wrong name would be on the lips. But I think the most important thing from Kirsten's point of view is that we make every effort to not offend anymore. The relationship had a breakdown. She was wearing the cost. And I think it's important to point that out about repentance because if repentance was perfection, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. And yet, true repentance is recognising the cost of the offence and not wanting to offend anymore. I think it would have really um, rubbed salt into the wound for poor Kirsten, if, you know, we had just sort of said, well, you know, truly, haven't I always been, you know, a good person to you in the past? Pauline. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and come on, I'll be a good person to you in the future. Pauline. <laughs> that's not repentance, that's hypocrisy. To say, hey, I'm a good person but to continue to deliberately offend. Well, she had to wear the cost. The cost for God is much greater because, you see, God, through Jesus, did not die for his relatives or his friends. He died for those who were enemies. Well, that's God's definition. When we were sinners, Christ died for us. When we were enemies... Christ died for us. I don't think there's anyone in this room who thinks of themselves as an enemy of God. The reason is simple. The person who commits the crime, who breaks the law, has a totally different attitude than the victim every time. You know, if I see someone uh, burgling your house, right, running down the street with a computer. Now, what's the obvious thing if I'm running down past them? I'm going to interview them, right? Now, hey... <laughs> What are you doing taking that computer off those people? You got something against them personally? No, it's nothing personal, mate. You know, I just want this to sell it, buy some drugs, you know? Nothing personal. See, to him, it's nothing personal. But what about, have you ever had your house burgled? Anything you ever had it stolen? It's very personal. You feel personally violated. See, the perspective is totally different. We don't think of ourselves as enemies, you know. You, you ask the bank robber who's going in to rob the bank. Now, that teller in there, is that your enemy? No, not my enemy. I just want their money. You know, it's nothing personal. Not my enemy. You know? But what about the bank teller? You know, ask them, this person who's just shoved a gun in your face, is this your enemy? <laughs> you see, different perspective. And the human condition is such that we think we're the centre of the universe, that we think that our law-breaking... It's not that bad. It's nothing personal, nothing that offensive. 
And it's a testimony to the love of God that he would die not only for people who have broken this relationship and made themselves enemies, but people who don't even think it's that bad anyway. I'm going to sum up here by saying that Christianity is an amnesty. Christianity is an amnesty. You all know what an amnesty is? We had an amnesty uh, here in Australia a few years back. There was uh, the big uh, gun buyback where the semi-automatic weapons were illegal and the government bought back all these illegal weapons, all these illegal guns, right? Now, you might have been one of those people who um, has your illegal guns there and you say, okay, illegal guns, you didn't, I didn't even know I was breaking the law. So, you know, you might not have even been aware that you are breaking the law. Suddenly you know. Well, it's just like the Ten Commandments. You might have just looked at them for the first time and go, wow, I didn't realise it was that bad. Now you know. Amnesty has a couple of things about it. Number one, amnesty, well in this case, the amnesty was such that the guns are illegal, you've got something that's illegal and the government's going to pay you for something you've got that's illegal. Do you see the analogy there? You've got something that's illegal, they're going to pay you. The second thing about amnesty is that to get the free pardon, for the illegal guns. You actually got to take your illegal guns and bring them in and hand them over. You got to come forward and hand them over. You don't hand them over, you don't get the free pardon, you don't get the payment, you get the fine. The other thing about amnesty is that there's a time limit. See, there's a time limit. I think it was 12 months or something like that. And if you hand over those illegal guns during that 12 months, you receive the free pardon and the, and the payment. All right? But if you get caught outside that time limit, you pay. The time limit for us is this lifetime, and we don't know when it runs out. So there we have it, a free pardon. That's good news. Free pardon's good news. The evidence that Jesus told the truth is overwhelming. So the evidence is good. So uh, why wouldn't everybody be on this? You know, why wouldn't everybody believe it? If it's that simple, you know, I know the evidence is good because I don't think there's a single person here who's, who's going to walk out of here going, well, I, I think maybe Jesus was a liar after all. You know, I never met a single person who read the New Testament for themselves who went away concluding that, that Jesus did anything but tell the truth. And it's as simple as that, believing that Jesus told the truth. So if it's as simple as that, how come everybody isn't believing it? Why wouldn't everybody be in on this? Is it because of the unanswered questions? We've all still got them, you know, things we're, we're still not sure about. You know, they're, they're legitimate, unanswered questions. But not one of these unanswered questions turns Jesus into a liar. You know, I haven't got all the answers on how gravity works but I'm not going to go jumping off a tall building and start flapping my arms. Because in the big picture, I know it's true. But if the big picture's true, how come everybody's not in on it? Why wouldn't everybody... Why would Jesus say, narrow is the path that leads to life, and only a few find it? Why would Jesus say that many people, many, who call themselves Christians, who are so confident that they're true believers, that right up to the day of judgment, they're still calling him, Lord, Lord. And he says, away from me, I never knew you. How could that be? Why wouldn't everybody be in on this? Well, it's not because of the evidence. And it's not because of the unanswered questions. Most people will not believe in the true sense because most people don't want to give up their guns. 